I talked to a guy a couple of weeks ago who was telling me that his uh, wife's purse had been stolen. It had some money in it and all of her credit cards. And I was listening to him. I was like, you did report your credit cards as stolen, right? And he goes, no, nah, I didn't really see a need to. The thief's spending way less money than my wife did. <laughs> so, yeah, so I hear the guys laughing. I hear a lot of guys, and, and the ladies are all uh, a little irritated at me right now. The truth is, though, women do make more credit card purchases than men. Now, guys, don't look smugly at your wife because there's a flip side to that. The flip side is when guys do make credit card purchases, it tends to be way bigger and have a bigger impact on our credit card balance. So listen to these fairly depressing results of a study that was recently done by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York analyzing the American family increase in debt just in the second quarter of 2024. So that's just April, May, and June of this year. Listen to this. Overall total, the household debt rose by $109 billion, with a B, in just this three-month period. Automobile loan balances increased by $10 billion. Home mortgage balances increased by $77 billion. And maybe the most concerning is that credit card balances rose by $27 billion in just a three-month period. If that's not depressing enough, how about this recent study by Experian, Experian, the credit card reporting agency, that reported that 73% of Americans, when they die, will still be in debt. For so many Americans, our finances are all messed up. We, we can't pay our bills. We're going into debt. We can't start an emergency savings fund. We can't uh, take care of everything that we've got going on. But it actually goes deeper than that because money has an impact on the rest of our lives. Money causes us stress and anxiety. It can affect our mental health. I, I read that the number one fight in marriages or topic for fights is money more than anything else. And it causes us to lose hope and it causes us to lose joy. A survey conducted back in March of this year showed that 47% of Americans admitted that money is having a negative impact on their mental health. A few years ago, the American Psychological Association reported that 72% of Americans would say they've had significant financial stress in the last 30 days. And then I saw a survey from just a couple of weeks ago talking about our concerns going into this November election, and the number one concern is inflation because we just don't have enough money to pay our bills. The result of all of that is money matters. But for those of us who follow Jesus, there's even a bigger reason to be concerned about our finances and to make sure that we have our financial houses in order. And that is because there is a real connection between how we view our money and our relationship with Jesus. Look at how Jesus says this in Luke 16, 11 through 13. He says, so if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. That's pretty tough talk from Jesus. He is saying that there is a real connection between how we view money, how we view our finances, and our relationship with him. And he's also saying that how we view our money impacts the blessings that we receive from him. Jesus is saying money matters. All right, so do I have you good and depressed going into this sermon series? There's some good news. The Bible has really great wisdom about how to get our financial houses in order, how to get control of our money. And so I'm excited that we're doing this three-week series called Money Matters, where we're looking at these different areas of our finances. One of the things that I really love about the Bible is even if you don't believe the ultimate truth, even if you don't believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and he did what he claims to have done, even if you're not there yet, you're not buying into everything this church says, there's still some really good wisdom in the Bible for living. You can learn how to make your marriage better, how to make your family relationships better, your friendships better. And yes, you can even con learn to control your finances in a better way. And so for everybody, there's something here. If you're a note taker, this is a sermon series where I encourage you to take notes. Also, feel free. We're going to put some real practical tips up on the screen as we get going. Feel free to take pictures of those to remind you of those tips. Well, our sermons over the next three weeks are spend, save, and give, which coincidentally just happens to match up with these buckets that I have here on the, on the stage. 
Because the reality is pretty much all of our money goes into one of these three buckets. Now, there are some subcategories within these buckets, like the spend bucket. If you spend money on a credit card or you go into debt, it goes in this spend bucket because you're spending money that you don't even have yet. I talked to someone after church last Sunday who was really honest with me. It's a person that serves and is really connected to our church. And that person said, I hate it when churches talk about money. She said, it, it always feels like they're asking, they need, they need my money for something. And our, our worship pastor, Sean, was sitting there as well. And I said, Sean, how many times have I said this church needs your money? And he thought about it. And he said, I don't think I've ever heard you say that. And the reason you've never heard me say that is because I've never said that. Money is not about what the church needs. And in fact, money, is not a, and, uh, money talk is not about what God needs. It is actually about getting your financial house in order to make sure that your relationship with Jesus is right. And quite frankly, I'm excited because I think you're going to get some practical tips to help you do a better job on getting out of debt. And the reality is, I talk about money less than I should because I don't like preaching about money. And I know that I talk about money way less than Jesus did because he talked about money a lot. And so that tells me that I probably don't preach on that topic enough. And this is actually our first money series that we've had since we uh, planted the church three and a half years ago. And look, I'm not pulling any punches about what we're doing. Our first week is we're going to talk about spending and how to get your spending under control. Next week, we're going to talk about saving and thinking about godly principles for, for saving and how to go about doing that. And then the third week is about giving and generosity. And what I would ask is that if you find the first two weeks helpful, that you come back for that third week because I think you're going to find that helpful too as it relates to your relationship with Jesus. All right, so let's get started. Bucket one represents your spending. Bucket two is your savings. And bucket three is the money that you give away. All right, I've got a fourth bucket over here labeled income. And this is, represents all of the money that you have coming in, whether that's paychecks or some other source of income. And some of you guys are looking at this and thinking, man, that that bucket is way too big to represent my income. Maybe my income should look more like this. But I'm going to use the bucket because it just kind of fits the theme a little better. But this represents everything that comes into your household. And for most of us, it's pretty simple. It's a paycheck. That's what comes in. And then the reality is most of our money goes into this first bucket, the spend bucket. We spend money on a mortgage payment or on rent. We pay a car payment. We have different bills for cell phones and things like that. We have to buy insurance and clothes and food. And so we find that a pretty significant part of our income goes into that spin bucket. And if I ask some of you what percentage of your income goes in this spin bucket, you'd do some quick calculations and you'd say, I I don't know the exact percentage, but whatever all of it is, whatever that percentage is, that's the percentage that I spend. And in fact, some of you are actually spending more than 100% because you're using debt and credit cards to pay for some of your spending. And then if we have a little money left over, maybe we save a little bit. Maybe that goes into a 401k or some other long-term savings, or maybe it's just a, a little account to help us. Uh, maybe that's in just, you know, maybe you got a piggy bank somewhere and you save a little money in there. And then if there's anything left at the end of the month, maybe you give a little bit away. And that's what it looks like. And that's a little depressing if we really think about it. I, I said earlier that one of the cool things about the Bible is that even if you don't believe the ultimate truth of the Bible, that Jesus is the Son of God, but you can still get some practical wisdom. But this first truth really applies only to Christians. But here in a minute, I'm going to tell you, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, how you can use this same principle to help your finances. But this is for Christians. They need to understand that every financial decision is a spiritual decision. The reality is that's correct. Now, a lot of us think about giving back to God as being a spiritual decision. But I think so often we don't think about buying a new car as being a spiritual decision or even going out to dinner. But it is, all of those decisions have spiritual implications because we don't want to give that area of our life up. I think for a lot of Christians, there's this area or two that, man, we do not want to give to Jesus. Maybe that's what we do on Saturday night. Maybe that's our sexuality. Maybe that's our job. And for a lot of us, it's money. If we're honest, we just don't really think that God ought to be involved in our money. But what's funny about that is it changes when we get into financial struggles. 
when we have a hard time paying our mortgage or we're in debt that we can't get out of or we lose our job and we're trying to pay our bills, suddenly we want God involved in our finances. This area that we've kept him out of, suddenly we want him to play a part in. But, but let me ask you a question. Why does God want to get involved in a financial area that you've kept him out of? Why does he want to bless something that you haven't blessed him with? And regularly, I'll have people come and ask for prayer for their job or some financial issues. I think probably prayer for financial issues is second only to prayers for health issues. And that's a good thing. We need to pray to God when we are having financial struggles. We need to ask for his blessing and give him thanks even where we are. But the reality is we need to start involving him in our finances before we get into trouble. We need to pray to him about how we spend and how we save and how we give. And then when we get involved in some trouble, he's already involved in that area and he will bless it. So for a Christian, every financial decision is a spiritual decision. And here's why. All of the money belongs to God. Whether you like it or not, whether you want to believe it or not, it all belongs to God. Listen to what Psalm 24.1 says. This is King David. He says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live it. Everything belongs to God. Now look at Haggai 2.8 if you didn't think that was specific enough to your money. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. It, it all belongs to God. And, and I think some of you are going to say, no, 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 no. That's not God's money. That's my money. I worked hard to make that money. I'm proud of what I've done and, and the money I've made. But let me ask you some questions. Who gave you the talent and the ability to make that money? Who put you in a place and a time where what you're talented at makes a difference? Like if you're a computer person, how well would those skills have paid out if you'd have been born in the Middle Ages? God put you here in this place. He gave you the ability. He gave you the energy. He gave you the drive to make that money. And it all belongs to him. Now, here's why this truth about God owning all the money is so important for you to get your financial house in order. Because if it doesn't belong to you and it belongs to someone else, you're going to think about that money different. You're going to think about how you spend that money different. How many of you guys have a job where you can spend some of the company's money? You either have a company credit card or you have an ability to spend client money or company money. Does anybody have jobs where you have that ability? Yeah, we got a few. Okay. Do you think about how you spend that money differently than how you spend your own money? Of course you do. Like if you go out and buy a new pair of shoes with the company credit card, you're gonna get fired and you might go to jail. And so you use a different level of wisdom when you decide how to spend the company's money or how to spend a client money. But the truth is we should view all of our money that way because it belongs to God. And one day we're gonna have to answer for how we use his money. And here's how that transitions into wise money management. If you think about it as belonging to someone else, you're going to be a little more reluctant to spend it and, and to make purchases that you don't really need. You're going to hit, want to hear preaching and teaching about money because you're going to want to get it right. And so understanding that truth that every financial decision is a spiritual decision is important. It's an overall concept that you're going to need for all three weeks as we go through this. This idea will actually even change the basic question you ask about money and your relationship with God. I think Christians, we most often think about money this way. How much of my money should I give to God? But that's not the right question. The right question is, how much of God's money should I spend and save for myself? And if you can do that, that will change the way you approach spending. Now, for you that are non-Christians, here's how that principle applies to you. It, just think about it as spending someone else's money. And before you make a purchase, would this be a wise thing for me to spend if it's somebody else's money? All right. So with this basic understanding that every financial decision is a spiritual decision, let's really focus in on this spending aspect. And we're going to look at some truths from the Bible from a guy named King Solomon. King Solomon was an Old Testament Jewish king. He was the richest man that ever lived. The Bible says that his income in gold was the equivalent of $800 million every year. And that's just one aspect of his income, and that's not his wealth. He's the richest man that ever lived, but he was also the wisest man that ever lived. And he wrote three books of the Old Testament uh, that are filled with wisdom for how to, to live. One is called the, the Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs, and it is wisdom about finding intimacy and excitement in your marriage. There's another book that he wrote called Proverbs that is just practical 
wisdom for living. And it's all these little short quotes uh, about how we can live better lives. And then the last book, and we'll look at that first verse first, is the book of Ecclesiastes, where he talks about what is the true meaning of life? What should we be chasing after most of all? All right, with that understanding, here's the first biblical principle that you need to understand to get your spending in order. It's not about income. I know some of you guys are going, wait a second, Nathan, it is about income, but it's really not. Some of you are thinking, if man, if I could just get a bigger paycheck, if I could get that raise or that promotion at work, then I could pay my bills and maybe I could save a little and give a little away and be more generous. But the reality is getting control of your finances has less to do with income and more to do with spending. Listen how King Solomon says this in Ecclesiastes 5, 10 through 11. He says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? Solomon is saying that you will never make enough money to be satisfied and to cover everything. Here's another way to say what King Solomon is saying. Your yearnings always exceed your earnings. As your income increases, so does your appetite to buy things. I, I know lots of people that I've known for years, and some of them make a lot more money than what they made when I first met them. And some of those people are in bigger financial trouble now, making way more money than they used to, than they were back when they made less money. They're in more debt, they have more struggle. The reality is, as their income has increased, so have their yearnings, and so there are boats, and cars, and jet skis, and houses, and all these different things that they spend money on. And you don't need me to tell you that, you know that's true. How many of you guys have read stories about uh, somebody winning the lottery and within two or three years, they're, they're bankrupt? Or a professional athletes who are making tens of millions of dollars every year, and a few years after they're out of the league, they've got no money left. And, and that's what happens. We all spend a lot of time daydreaming about what it would look like if we made more money. How many of you guys have spent some time daydreaming about what you'd do if you won the lottery? Come on, be honest. Uh, the next question is, who's lying, right? I mean, that's the other question. I have. But think about when you think about winning the lottery and you daydream about that, does your life look similar to what it does now? Of course not. There's some island in the Pacific somewhere that you bought. There's boats and planes and all of that other stuff. Your yearnings always exceed your earnings. And it's okay to daydream about winning the lottery, but that's not financial planning. You can also daydream about a raise or a promotion at work. But that too is not financial planning. That's not how you get control of your finances. The problem for so many Americans who live paycheck to paycheck isn't the side of the paycheck. It's where that paycheck goes and how much they spend. No matter how much you make, if you don't have good financial management, you're not gonna get control of your finances. Bad financial management can get rid of millions of dollars just like it can get rid of the money you have right now. The reality is that financial freedom doesn't come from making more, it comes from spending less. Focus less on your income, and here's the main reason why. You don't have a lot of control over this bucket. You don't control when your next raise is, or when your promotion is, or if you get a better paying job. Give that to God. You can do things to improve that, but don't stress and worry about that, and don't bank on that. Give that over to God. Where you can make a difference is beginning to focus on these three buckets. So our first financial principle on uh, spending is it's not about income. Here's the second principle. Know where it goes. You've heard the old saying about money, money talks. But the reality is that's not true. Money generally just sw slips away quietly without telling us where it went. And if you don't have a budget, you really don't know where your money is going. I read a survey that said that two out of three Americans don't have a budget. So that means that only 33% or one out of three actually knows where their money goes. And I can promise you, if you're closing your eyes and throwing money at those buckets, I can tell you which one it's gonna go into. It's gonna go into that spending bucket. Here's what Solomon says about this issue in Proverbs 21.5. He says, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. That's Proverbs 21. Five. And then listen to what he says in Proverbs 27, 23 through 24. Be sure to know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. So what Solomon is saying here is pay attention to where your wealth is. Pay attention to where your money goes. 
Now, he focuses on herds uh, here because a whole lot of their wealth was tied up in animals. But for us, it's a paycheck. And so we need to understand where our money goes. Plan out how you spend money. And I think as you start to put a budget together, you're going to start to see some areas where you can save some money. Do you really need to spend $75 a month on a cell phone? Do you need to spend $150 a month on TV apps? Where can you maybe save some money on rent? Or how can you get a cheaper car? Maybe you can eat out less or do Starbucks way less often because you're putting a lot of money into coffee. Can you go to movies less often? Look, I I don't know where you can find savings when you budget. But you don't either until you budget. A budget isn't a complex thing. In simple terms, a budget is just telling you your money where to go rather than just wondering where it went. If you don't have a budget, you you shouldn't be surprised that you don't have control over your finances. So here's my challenge if you don't have a budget. Start preparing a budget for 2025. Get that together. You gotta start now with your fixed expenses, rent payment or a housing expense. Then you put in your car payment and get those things there. And then try to figure out where you can save some money or where you can pay off some debt by maybe eating out a little less or a little less entertainment. The, the key to a budget, though, is stick to it. So if you run out of money in a month for entertainment, don't spend any more money on entertainment or eating out. Find free things to do or eat at home. That is the key to really improving your financial situation. When I first got out of law school 30 years ago, I, we were in a ton of debt. My wife and I had my law school debt, but we'd also racked up a ton of credit card debt to live on. And man, I understood the, the, the whole idea of, of you know, being in debt and credit card debt because we had a lot of it. And so we sat down and we prepared a budget and we decided how much we want to pay on credit card debt. And we began to pay that off. And when we got that paid off, we continued to use a budget for quite a few years. But over the last few years, we really haven't done a budget because we've done a really good job of, of, of being generous with our money and saving some money. But my wife, a couple of weeks ago, she sat down and calculated how much we've spent over the last year eating out. And I was kind of floored by that number. The reality is we weren't telling our money where to go, and so now we wonder where it went. And so we're choosing to eat out less often. So you've got to have a budget. Stick to it. All right, here's the next financial truth for this week. Limit debt. Look, I know we all have different perspectives on debt. Some of you are okay with it. Some of you hate it. And the reality is not all debt is bad. Debt can be a tool. Debt debt can be a tool to start a business, grow a church, or even buy a home. And most of us, we wouldn't own our home if it weren't for the ability to get a mortgage payment. But before you take on debt, you need to be very thoughtful about it. You need to be very prayerful about it and involve God in that decision. Here's what King Solomon says about debt in Proverbs 22.7. He says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. If you're in debt, you know exactly what he's talking about. And really, that's true for every kind of debt. Because even with respect to your house, there's a certain amount of your money every month that has to go pay for that debt. And so you know what that is. But look, a house can be a very good investment because you're actually investing in something that probably will grow in value. And you're actually what I call forced savings. You're saving money into something that has value. But you need to really think about if you're ready for those kinds of purchases. But there's other kind of debt that's way more damaging to our financial situation. Automobiles, it's a tough one, because the reality is when you go out and borrow money for a brand new car and you drive it off the lot, you're immediately upside down on the note. You now owe more than that car is worth if you finance the whole thing. So you need to be very thoughtful about financing car debt. My family, we actually tend to save for several years getting ready to buy a new car so that we either pay for the whole car or sometimes we'll borrow just a fractional portion of the overall value of the car so that when we drive it off the lot, it still has more value than what we owe so we can get rid of that debt by selling the car. And then the worst debt you can have is credit card debt. It is absolutely what will mess your finances up. And if you have credit card debt, you understand this truth from Solomon that the debtor is a slave to the lender because you are indebted to those credit card companies. In getting ready for this sermon, I looked up what the average interest rate is for credit cards right now. I was blown away by the percentage. The average credit card interest rate right now is 25%. I saw some credit cards that are upwards of 39%. That has a dramatic impact on your finances. 
You're held hostage, especially if you're making minimum payments. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But understand the impact of that. Let me give you just a couple of numbers to help you understand what that means. So if you owe $1,000 now on a credit card, that means in one year, you'll owe $1,250. In two years, you're going to owe $1,562. And after three years, you're going to owe almost twice what you have on that credit card now. It's an incredible impact. And that's only if you don't make any more purchases between now and then. Credit card debt is the debt that you should work to pay off first. And when you get out of credit card debt, never go back. That's where I was when we got out of credit card debt. And if you're wondering, oh, I don't really have a credit card yet, stay there. <laughs> don't get there. All right, but let's talk about some strategies to reduce your credit card debt. Here's some practical tips. Here's the first one. Make more than the minimum payment. There's a tendency to just want to pay whatever the required amount is, which is usually about 2% of the total balance. But what you need to understand is that credit card companies make the most money when you stay in debt. They want you to stay in debt because that's how they make money. And if you're paying just 2%, it is going to take you a long, long time to pay off that credit card, and you're going to pay a ton of interest. Now, don't just believe me. Take out your credit card statement and look at it. Usually they have a warning there for minimum payments. And you're going to be surprised to see how much interest you'll pay and how long it'll take you to pay off that credit card if all you're doing is paying the minimum payment. So what you need to do is up that and pay more than that minimum payment, even if it's just a little bit. It kind of upsets the interest calculations, and you'll find yourself starting to get ahead and knocking out that debt. All right, here's the next strategy. Pay off cards with a higher interest rate first. In other words, get out all of your credit card bills, line them up, and see which one has the highest interest rate and start paying that one off first because that's the one that's costing you the most money every month. Then when you get that one paid off, move to the one that's got the next highest interest rate and pay that one off. Now, some of you guys may be thinking, Nathan, I, I just need a win. I need to have some success in paying off debt. Here's an alternative strategy that you can use. If you've got a credit card with a small balance, tackle that one first. Get a win. Does that make sense? Get it paid off. Get the, the joy and the happiness of seeing the difference that makes. And then go to that highest interest rate card and start paying that one off. But the best financial strategy is to start paying the highest interest rate card first. All right. Here's another strategy you can consider in trying to tackle credit card debt. Consider a fixed rate debt consolidation loan. So Here's what that means. That means that you get a loan, maybe it's a home equity loan or a personal loan that consolidates all those credit cards into one account. Now, what it doesn't do is get you out of debt. You still have the same amount of debt. But usually a home equity loan or a personal loan has a lower interest rate than credit card debt. So what you're doing is more of your money you're paying each month goes to paying off the balance rather than just paying off interest. And it can help you save some cash and you can begin to catch up and pay off debt faster. This leads us to our final financial truth for today, avoid impulse spending. This one gets us into trouble. It does. Who ever here has made a purchase and immediately regretted it? Come on, be honest. We've all done it. I've done it too. Uh, I know maybe you saw that you were out shopping with a friend and you saw that blouse that was just it was the perfect blouse, but then you get it home and you realize it doesn't go with anything else, so you just hang it in your closet and it's still got the tags on it. I saw a survey from a few years ago about impulse purchases, and it's pretty interesting. 54% of people admitted that they'd made at least one impulse purchase over $100. 20%, an additional 20%, said they'd made at least one impulse purchase over $1,000. Now, this was everything from TVs to cars and boats that they'd bought on impulse. So the total percentage of people that admitted an impulse purchase was 74%. Now, by quick math, that means that 26% of the people lied in responding to that survey. But according to the same study, impulse purchases are, impact younger generations more than old. The best way to stay out of credit card debt is to avoid impulse purchases because the credit card is the perfect tool to get into trouble because you don't even have to pay money. It's not even real. You just need that little plastic miracle that you just throw down and they give you stuff for free. But the reality is that's not the way it works. And that's why stores are so willing to give you their credit card and sign you up. And you're thinking, man, I, I don't really have the credit for this. They'll give it to you because they want you to make that impulse purchase. Advertising also fuels impulse spending. 
100% of advertising is built on this idea. Buy it and buy it now. You're never going to hear an ad that says this. This is a great product. So think about it a couple of months, pray through it, decide if it's the best purchase for you. And if it fits within your budget, go out and buy this product. Have you ever heard that on an advertisement? Of course not. The advertisements tell you that you're going to be happier, smarter, fitter, sexier, healthier, and less bald if you buy the product and you buy it right now. Beer commercials, I think, are the very best at this because beer commercials suggest that if you drink a bunch of beer, that you're going to go to really cool parties with great looking people, usually on a beach. But, but that doesn't even make sense. If you drink a lot of beer, you're going to have a beer belly, which is not going to inv- get you invited to parties with beautiful people, and you sure don't want to be on a beach in your beach clothes. But advertising isn't about reality or truth. It's about convincing us to buy stuff and to buy it right now. They even understand the buzzwords that they need to use to get us to impulse buy, and the biggest of those is sale. Man, when we see a sale, it just makes us want to buy it because if those shoes are 40% off, you're going to be losing money if you don't buy those shoes. How many times have you said, think about all the money I'm saving on this sale? (laughs) You're not saving, you're spending. It's going in this bucket. And if you put it on a credit card, all of those savings in that sale are going to be eaten up in credit card fees and interest payments. Got to get control of impulse spending. As Christians and as wise managers of money, we have to learn the idea of delayed gratification. If you can't afford something, don't buy it. If you can't afford to go on vacation without financing it, don't go on vacation. Don't spend so much on Christmas presents this year that you put it on credit cards. Because what happens is you're going to pay for that Christmas present all year long, and it's going to eat away at your finances. I would have encouraged some of you that struggle with impulse buying for a big purchase, Give yourself a seven-day cooling off period. If you decide you want to buy it, take seven days, and for seven straight days, pray to God, ask him if this is a wise financial purchase for you, and see if a week later you still feel the same way. If you want to get control of your finances, you've got to stop impulse spending and, and get control of credit card debt. When you work out your budget for 2025, start thinking about how much debt you can pay off and start with those credit cards, and then make it happen. Stick with it. Because if you can just eliminate credit card debt, you're going to be amazed at what your finances will look, look like and how much further your money will go. So here are the things to take away from today. First, every financial decision is a spiritual decision. Take time to pray through those things. Take time to pray for your budget, for your spending, your saving, and your giving. And then remember these financial truths from the Bible. It's not about income. It's about expense. Know where your money goes. And finally, limit debt and impulse spending. That's how you begin to get control over your finances. Next week, we're going to tackle this second bucket, savings. And we're going to talk about some godly principles and way to think about saving money. And I really want to challenge you to be here all three weeks so you can really learn to honor God with your money and get control of your finances. Let's pray.